Okay, let's begin in Genesis before we get to our study in 1 John. Let's do a little um, way to set this lesson up. Let's start Genesis chapter 19 and verse 24. And you remember this story, Genesis 19, 24. Good to see you out. I'm so glad to be here with you. Genesis 19, 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. This is that God who absolutely did send from heaven his beloved son, Jesus Christ, right. to shed his blood on the cross that whoever believes in Christ could be saved. That same God that sent his beloved son from the heavens down to the earth also sent fire and brimstone down to earth. It's the two uh, sides of God that we should be aware of, his his holy love and his holy wrath. And that will kind of drive our thinking tonight. But truly, verse 26 is the lesson for us directly. 26, uh, we're in Genesis 19, 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife. We don't even know her name. We know her as Lot's wife, but she is... Uh, an everlasting testament, testimony to loving this world. She has love, but not for God. And not for her neighbor, we'll prove that tonight. But just love for this world. Love for the pleasures of this world, the possessions of this world, the praise of this world. That's Lot's wife. And she couldn't walk away from it. I mean, the one rule she had was, I'm going to save you, God says, but you got to march out and you can't look back. She couldn't do it. Her love was all those things and all the, all the praise there. I like that list. Pleasures, possessions, and praise. That, that kind of sums it up, doesn't it? And... Um, the praise of man. All her love was there in Sodom. Everything she wanted. She couldn't look away, even when God told her to. Well, we're going to see in 1 John that God tells Christians to look away and not look back to this world. We are to walk through this world as pilgrims. We've brought nothing in. We can carry nothing out. Christians are supposed to understand this better than anybody else. It does not matter. I was talking to a brother a second ago about um, loss. We could suffer great loss in possessions and things. Actually, a couple weeks back, someone challenged me on that. He, he actually was he was predicting because he thinks he's a semi-prophet. He's, he's prophesying, Logan, you're going to lose everything you've got because of what I believe. And, and my answer back was, I'm ready to lose everything I've got. Every Christian is supposed to be ready to lose everything for the cause of Christ. So if we lose everything we have, our health, our homes, our cars, our buildings, it's not God anyways. We don't need it. We'll be just fine. We don't need these things. Lot's wife is looking back like, that's everything I've ever had and loved. It shouldn't be because there's so much more than what you'd find in Sodom and Gomorrah or in any town today. Let's look, at, let's look at our text here in 1 John chapter 2. Let's let come what may. These buildings aren't what hold us up. These bones aren't what hold us up. Our friendships aren't what hold us up. It's God Almighty. And if He wants us to keep standing, we'll be just fine. Look at 1 John chapter 2. It's liberating to understand that Sodom is not holding you up. Amen. Nothing in this world is keeping you afloat. It's God. It's liberating. You're, it's not your job. It's not your effort. It's not your overtime. It's not your husband's job that's holding you up. It's God Almighty. Look at 1 John chapter 2. We're on verse 15 now. Here's the verse that should have been preached in um, Lot's wife's ear more. 
I'm sure it was told to her in this way, in some way, shape, or form. Look at 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Big verses, challenging verses to not love the world. Sometimes we quote these verses and I think people don't understand what they mean. Sometimes it can be just out of, I think, an innocent kind of mind. Because what does the Bible tell us to do? It tells us to love God and to love who? Our neighbor, as ourselves. We're supposed to love our neighbor. But here we're not supposed to love the world. So as I was studying this, I think, well, what does that mean, to love your neighbor but not love the world? I think it has everything to do with what you love about your neighbor. What do you love about your neighbor? You can say you're a person filled with love, and a lot of people profess to be, I'm just such a loving person. But what do you really love about people? Lot's wife, did she love the souls of Sodom? Did she love the souls of her own children? I'll submit to you, I don't think so. And I question Lot's love for his family as well. Because he did not give any, they didn't have any regard to the souls of those people. None of them knew the truth. None of them knew what was right or wrong. None of them knew what saves. Today we can say that we love people, but what do we really love about people? Look at verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. We talked a little bit about this before, but you can say you love somebody, but actually you're just lusting after them, and a lot of marriages start that way. It says the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. A lot of people profess to love people, but what they really love is what they see and they might be able to get out of some relationship, right? A lot of false preachers and teachers do this. Oh, you know, that pastor really has a heart for people. Does he really, or does he just really like the tithe check that they drop in, right? Oh, you know, this person really loves me. You know, we think about that with children. My kids really love me. Or is it they love you or they just love the fact that you, you're still supporting them when they're 47 years old or whatever, living in their basement? Not against anybody if they're 47 living in the basement. I don't know if I hit any certain demographic there. Forgive me. But love, it's, it can be false. We say we really love people, but we really love something else about them. And how about the last one? The pride of life. People love the pride of life. So, oh, I just, I, I love people. That's why I'm so ready to serve people and all that, because I love them. Do you really love people, or do you just love the praise they give you? No, I love people. That's why I would never say anything harsh to them, because I love them so much. No, you just love that they like you, and they make you feel good about yourself. You don't really love them, or you'd tell them the truth. Right? It's like a doctor just wants to make everybody like him. I could be a very popular doctor if everybody came into my office and I just said, you know what? No problem here. You're, you're perfect health. I'd be a popular doctor, wouldn't I? But I wouldn't love any of my patients. <laughs> That's how church work goes, though. You're all perfect. You're special. You're wonderful. No problems here. Well, like pastors, but it wouldn't be real love, would it? Real love. Today I want to talk about uh, real love. And I want to honestly say that real love will hate evil. Real love will hate evil. If Lot's wife had a true godly love, she would have hated the evil in Sodom a long, long time ago. But instead, she did not have a godly love. She had this love of the world, and it ate her up. It overpowered her. We talked about uh, some things that make it impossible for us to love how God loves. We said, didn't we say that sin, right, if we're walking out of the light, we're walking in darkness, we're not going to be able to love how God loves. We're not. But also, and it's related to this, but also we're never going to be able to love how God wants us to love if we're infatuated with the things of this world. That's what we really love. And think about that, because it's, it's, it's a little bit deep level here. It's not, it's not necessarily a, I can't flat out say it's a sin that you love the, the praise of man. You say pride's a sin, and of course it is, but uh, it's tricky. What's driving you? You say, I love my family. What do you really love about your family? Do you love their souls enough to tell them the truth about the Savior, to make hard decisions? 
Or do you just want to enable them, right? So you can keep having your style of life that you're used to. You can have your days in Sodom go well. I want to, I want to make the point tonight, um, true love is to hate evil. We'll show you some scriptures here. We'll show you some scriptures. Look, um, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. All these love, these things we love in the world, they're not of the Father, but they're of the world, and they all pass away. It's like loving something that, that's not going to last. And that Lot's wife was loving that Sodom that was literally decaying right in front of her. We love friendships that aren't going to matter. We love possessions that aren't going to matter. Ever. We have an infatuation with these things. The Bible tells us to love not the world. The Bible tells us that we shouldn't love the praise of men. Look at Romans 12 and verse 9. 12, 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation. That means, again, it means hiding under a false appearance. It's like a fake love, uh, insincere love. It says, Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now, if the, if the Lot, uh, Lot and his wife there in Sodom, had real love, they would have done that. Instead, they, they went down to that wicked place and they had this false love. Real love abhors that which is evil. Our world says it the opposite, don't they? Well, if you really love someone, you'll accept their sins. You'll accept the evil. No real love, uh, not fake love, is to abhor evil. It says cleave to that which is good. A real loving person will find what's right and they'll cleave to it. They won't let it go. And they'll abhor. They'll get away from it. Can't stand it. Like a garbage can. I, w I don't want this in my house. I'll get away from evil. It says in verse 10, it says, Be kindly affection one, one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Here's the truth. At no time are Christians called to love evil. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. At no time are we called to love evil. We're called to abhor evil. Love that does not abhor evil is fake love. And think about that in the context of all the Christians today that have that message. Well, you guys, you're, you need to be a more loving church, a more loving Christian, right? But they don't abhor evil. It's a fake love, absolute fake love. True love in this world will be one that says evil is wrong and, and abhors it. Remember, if love is to obey God, then what is, what is hate? To disobey God. We learned that in, in 1 John. If you love, you know, love me, keep my commandments. Herein is the love of God perfected. And we keep his commandments. So we as Christians, should we love obedience or should we love disobedience? Think about this. Should we be excited when someone obeys the Bible? Absolutely. Should we be upset when someone disobeys the Bible? Absolutely. It shows real love. In fact, when a Christian challenges you, maybe there's something that someone's challenged you with and they're, and they're upset about something they've seen, that whatever, some sort of disobedience somewhere, that's love coming through. Because we know that disobedience to God is always a bad thing. Look here at true love in Amos chapter 5. Amos 5. If you beat me there, you get six points. I'm trying to find it somewhere here. Where's it at again? There it is. It's, um, it's in the Bible right before Obadiah. Look at Amos chapter 5 and verse 10. 
This lesson today is kind of checking ourselves on what we really love, because I want us to be Christians that are full of love, but sometimes we need to check ourselves. What is it that we love about people? Is it actually something um, tied to what we saw there, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life? I know some, I know, I know one person, they have a family. And if you ask them, they would say they love their family incredibly. Um, but I, I, I know this person will. And what they really love is the semblance of a family. This idea that our family is doing really well. So no one say there's problems in it. Anybody know families like that? Just kind of want to be blind to the big elephant in the room, right? This is the big problem, but just, if we don't admit it, the whole family's just wonderful. We're like the, I don't know, the Waltons or the whatever, the Brady Bunch. We're, we're just perfect, the perfect little family. What they really love is that little perception that's not even true. And if they really love the souls in the family, they'd get real and say, this is not a good thing in our family. Look at it. Amos chapter 5. And the same thing goes for communities and churches. Look at 5.10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. To the world, they're not going to miss a beat on this. If they see someone um, with real love, right, this outspoken love, they're going to abhor that person. But Christians, on the other hand, we don't abhor evil. They, they, they know how to play their game better than Christians do. It says, They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. Look at all these things of the world that we love. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor and the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Yet in an evil day when evil is ruling, the smart ones will just keep their mouth shut. Right? If you want to get ahead as a Christian today, just keep your mouth shut. But God won't have us do that. Watch, it says that a little further down. 14, seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. 15, hate the evil and love the good. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. This is, this is what a life of love is, is getting these things right. So as we think about true godly love, does God himself, who is the embodiment of love, does he hate evil? Absolutely. It is abominable to his sight. He absolutely abhors it. That's why fire and brimstone came down upon the great sin of Sodom, which is sodomy. That's why hell is a real place, because God abhors evil. You can't speak of God's love without bringing up the fact that because of his great love, he abhors evil and how destructive it is. God's abhorrence for Satan is very well placed. All the destruction caused over many, many years. God's abhorrence for sin today and liars today is very real and very well placed. Say, Logan, you're teaching us to, to hate, to hate. Well, the Bible tells us to hate evil. I can't change the Bible. We've just got to figure out how this is all true. Love our neighbors as ourselves. Love your enemies. We take all these things in context. Yet we are to hate evil, abhor evil. Should get us fired up. Should cause us to speak out. Should never cause us to accept it. It says, an established judgment in the gate. That's what Lot should have done in that town. He didn't. He compromised. He let it go, just like we do in our families, like we do in our communities and in our churches. Call it whatever you want, but don't call that love. I, mean, I guess we're just trying to rethink all that. So let's say that Lot is in Sodom, and he starts preaching like crazy. This is sin, and this is sin. The whole town would say, you're the most hateful guy in the world, Lot. What are you doing? But in the eyes of from heaven, that is just days away from throwing down fire and brimstone, 
the eyes of heaven, God's like, that guy really loves you guys. He knows he's going to take flack for this stuff. He knows he's going to get, um, you know, persecuted for this stuff. But he's telling you the truth anyways, because by the way, I am angry. And I am angry at the wicked every day, the Bible says. Love, rethinking what it is. Rethinking what it is. It may be that the Lord, it says in there in verse 15, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. That's what we're looking for. If people repent, right? My people ret repent and turn to me. That's what we're hoping happens. But that will never happen until we say, Acts, it's wrong. What we're doing is wrong in America. What we're doing is wrong in our communities, in our churches, in our schools, in our homes. No one will repent. And with no repentance, there'll, there'll be no change in God's outcome, in God's judgment. It says, hate the evil and love the good. That's how we should view this world. We should not be, when we get attached to this world, the, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life, we can't help people. We, we love the stuff of Sodom as much as the people of Sodom love it. And we could never walk away from it. We should live as pilgrims, ready to walk away from anything, because it doesn't have our affection. It shouldn't. Look, let's go to Psalms, Psalm chapter 97. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. This is not a topic on a lot of churches' um, agenda these days. Why? Is it because they have more love? No, it's the opposite. They don't have true love. Godly love. Love is strong enough to tell the truth. Look at Psalm 97. Sometimes this manifests itself in strange ways. I was having a conversation online, and I'm a very imperfect person. You know that. You watch me all every week. But there was an opportunity online to, uh, some people were watching our church, and we had an opportunity to share something good. And I chose to share what I thought was the most loving thing I could, which was here's what the real gospel is and what the gospel is not. In my mind, and maybe I'm just crazy, but in my mind, that's the most loving thing a church could do when it has a, a window of opportunity. It's to say, well, okay, here, everybody in Sodom, let's just let's talk real for a second. This is true gospel. This is a false gospel. This is what saves. This is what scatters. That's love. But I did get some feedback, a pretty quick feedback, that I should have used the moment to say something good. Well, what's good <laughs> beyond Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? What's better than that? And to say that, no, that's not the gospel. Our world is strange. Christians who understand what love is, you're going to start looking weirder and weirder because the world doesn't know what love is anymore. Look at Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. You're kind of seeing a pattern here, aren't you? And I thought I just took one verse out of context. Oh my goodness, this must be real. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. So in this entire lesson, we're going to continue through 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Lord willing. We're going to keep talking about love and discovering what love is, godly love, and what it looks like. But let's remember this big part of it all. At no point does our love for God, our love for neighbor, turn us into people who love their sin. In fact, if we love those people, we'll hate evil. It's, let's go to Psalm 52, and I'll show you what the problem was, I think, with Lot, and then we'll go to that story of Lot, and we'll look at some of the details directly. <laughs> the story of Lot, I think we look at it as some phantasmal story that's not really related. It's becoming more and more relevant, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is. More and more relevant. You can see who Lot is. And you can see who he is, to, who he'd be today. Look at Psalm 52, verse 
3. We love people. We hate evil because evil damns souls to hell. It destroys homes, destroys communities. Evil in the form of false gospels will lead people straight to hell. You should have a healthy hatred for false gospels. Every one of us should. Try to tell that to another professing Christian this week. If you really love people, you defend Christ being the, the Savior. What could be worse? Think about everybody, if you had a good doctor on this earth, and you know you knew he was a good doctor, whatever he was saying, no, that's a terrible doctor, you'd probably get up and say, no, he's a good doctor. He actually can help people. You'd set the record straight. Well, when people get Christ wrong, you better get animated. You better speak up and say, no, he is the great physician. He's the one. Look at Psalm 52 and verse 3, please. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Christian, I say that it is possible for Christians to love evil more than good, at least for a short amount of time. In a backslidden state, I think Christians, we can have this problem, love evil more than good. Let's look at that in the context of Genesis 13. Genesis 13 and the story of Lot. Many times I'll preach the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to rebuke the world. Well, let's look at it from, this, from the point of view of a righteous man living in the world and what he loved. What he could have done differently. Genesis 13. He's, he's living here with Abraham. Abraham. But they have, a, they have a, some disagreement here. And they're going to go separate ways. Abraham gives Lot the choice. He can go where he wants. I almost think Abraham was giving him kind of a test here. What drives you in this life? You could be like me and pray your way through decisions, or you could just lean into your own understanding. Look at Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes. Remember we talked about the lust of the eyes? This is what it looks like. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord liked the land of Egypt, as out comes unto Zor. Lot looked with his eyes. He lusts with his eyes. He loves this world and the money he might make there, the possessions he might have there. This is a love of the world. But what should he love as a God-believing, right, righteous man, tells us, what should he love? God and his neighbors himself. Right now, his neighbors are his family. He doesn't love them. We make decisions right now that are going to impact his whole family, and you'll see it destroys his whole family. He didn't love them. Make decisions right now out of love. What do you love? People make decisions with work all the time, don't we? We, we talk about that. But are you making decisions based on love for the souls around you or for the things around you? Look at verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. He made a decision not based on prayer, not based on love for God or others, but based on love for what he saw with his eyes, love for possessions. We need to be careful about what we love more. Look at verse 12. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And we've preached it before. You've heard me preach it before. But everything in his life is dictated by his love for what he will be able to do in Sodom. For the possessions he'll be able to build, the business he'll be able to run, the praise he might receive. His whole life was positioned around this love of the world. It says in verse 13, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Because they were practicing sodomy. And here it calls this an exceedingly wicked sin. And I can't change scripture. That's what the Bible says. But that's what he's pitching his life toward. He should have abhorred the evil. Even here it says it was sin exceedingly. He should have abhorred it. He should have not, uh, he should have cleaved to good. Cleaved there by Abraham. Stay close to Abraham. But he loved the world. Your love is going to matter. What you love more is going to drive your life. 
If you can't get a healthy love for good, you're not going to cleave to it. We need to ask God that we ought to love like we ought. Love good, not evil. Look at Genesis 19. Genesis 19. I can, we've been in church a little while, and I've seen different people come and go, and I love all of them. But you can kind of see, I can almost see in someone's eyes that when, they're, when they start pitching their tent toward the world, right? And you can tell there's really no love for the souls around them or this love for brothers or sisters around them. They're, they're positioning their life to when they get a chance, they're going to march down into the world. Right? And they'll, they'll make a good case of it that they really love souls. And that's why they're doing that. But it's all about love of the world. You can see how a person positions their life. It's sad. You try to tell people that, no, we ought to have a love for God. Not for what we'll find in this world. Look at Genesis 19 and verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at Eve, and Lot sat in the, in the gate of Sodom. He's a judge in the city. How did he pull that off? I doubt he was saying much of anything. I doubt he was judging righteous judgment in this gate. He got a prestigious job, I'll bet, by being that quiet, mature believer that never calls evil, evil. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Well, well God's going to send some angels here to talk to Lot. This man who's compromised and loved the world more than God. Look at two. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. You know, Lot knows the danger in the street. He knows the sin in the town. He probably never said much about it, but he knows how evil and destructive it is. I like how we run our lives today. We know something's really evil, but we won't speak to it, but we kind of have a reservation about it. Well, he should have called it evil 20 years ago and helped change the outcome of the town. Look at four. But before they laid down, the men of, of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round, both old and young, all the people from Every quarter where this whole city is given into this, aren't they? And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Know them, of course, is that biblical term for they want to have relations with these angels, this, this form that they've taken as they come into this town, and they want to have relations with the angels. It's a ungodly, lustful city. They are led by the lust of the flesh, aren't they? This isn't love. It isn't love. It's a, it's a, it's a perverted lust of the flesh. This is actually quite hateful, isn't it? Lust of the flesh can be very hateful. Look, six. Or, no, let's go down to, yes, yeah, six, okay. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. He wants to have a private conversation. Probably because, you know, he's probably going to shut the door because he's probably going to be uh, ashamed at how mealy mouth he is about this. But he's got to save face with the world. I don't want the angels to hear what he's about to say. Because watch what he says in verse 7. It said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. <laughs> Y'all are my brothers. I love you guys. Let's just not, just, just not this one thing this one time, okay? He, this guy loves the world. He loves the praise of man. He loves the life he's built for himself. And he doesn't want to let it go, even in the face of such wickedness. He couldn't just rebuke this. Look at verse 8. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. He really loves his kids, too, doesn't he? <laughs> no love for kids either. What happened? His heart is so cold. No love for the souls. He's ready to let his kids, it, it could be by this point he sees that they've got no morals, he sees that they're just like Sodom anyways, perhaps that part of the equation, but he's the one that raised his kids in Sodom. Shows a real love for souls. No, it doesn't. Not at all. 
If his life had been driven by love for God and love for others, he would have made a lot more different decisions, wouldn't he, Dad? I think he's the worldly man, though. He, he's, he's got his treasure in this world. He's counting on the things of this world. This can be the story of a believer. It says in verse 9, And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. In my mind, that verse 9 is like the moment where, where Lot finally did stand up to these guys. Because they admit, We've been playing this game this whole time, Lot, you know. You know, you've been faking it and we've, you know, put up with you. And you've just been bowing to whatever we've wanted this whole time. Verse 9 to me is kind of a reality moment where they finally say what they really think. That we know you're a faker. <laughs> we know you didn't approve of us. But it's too late now. It's too late. They come near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. They're still so lustful. They're still trying to find the door. This is a society gone down the drain because no one's been calling good, good, and evil, evil for year after year after year after year. And I'll guarantee you that Sodom had churches or places of worship. I guarantee it. And I guarantee you that Sodom had believers of all kinds of shapes. But it went down the drain because they didn't hate evil. That's where our world's at today. It's the same kind of place. Sin paraded in the streets. Sin wanted to take our children and pervert them. And true Christians will hate the evil. Will hate the evil. They won't love this world. They won't love this world. Look back at... Um, um, let's go to 24. We the end of the story. Let me read you a couple of verses. Read you a couple of verses, because I think it, these passages describe Job's pride of life. He was a judge, wasn't he? How did he get that? How did he get everybody to like him? It was compromise. It was compromise. Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 26, he says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Jesus warned us, when you get everybody liking you, that's when you've just become a false prophet, a false teacher. When everybody's got a favorable report about you or your church, your family, it's a, it's a bad thing. It means you've never spoken against evil your whole life. Not much at all. Look at John 15, 19. If you were, or I'll read it for you, excuse me. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Why? Because you actually call evil, evil. You say it's wrong. Talk tonight about prayer requests, about family members going to see other family members. And you could stay mum in all those circles. You could never call evil, evil, and you could keep that relationship Good. We have it all the time, don't we? We see family members all the time who are in sin that we absolutely know about and false doctrine that we absolutely know about and we just keep our mouths shut and we say in our heads, I'm doing this because I, I love them. I want us to challenge ourselves. Do we really love them? Do we really love their kids? Or do we just love the way they make us feel about ourselves? I just love having this kind of family moment, this family time. I love having some smiles and some giggles with you all. I know you're not living right. You're not raising your kids right. And before long, your kids are going to be uh, like the kids of Sodom. I know that's down the road, but I just love these little kicks and giggles we get right now with each other. It's a false love. The love we're looking for in 1 John is this deeper love that says, I love your soul. So I'm absolutely going to tell you what's true. I love the souls of your children, so I've got to tell you this. I love it even more than this, than this piece of pie that we're sharing together or this family moment, this hallmark moment. I don't think Lot lived like that at all. I think he loved his wife too much in all the wrong ways. Didn't love her soul to stand up to her and say, no, honey, we're going down the drain. Didn't love his daughters. You can see that there. And then the end of it all is this demonstration that we read with Lot's wife, who had taken all of Lot's backsliddenness 
and his playing with the world, and it turned in, so you got one man, one believer in Lot, and his toying with the world, and his undue focus on the world, and his, his lust for the world, and all that, and then, to his wife right next to him, it totally consumed her, consumed his kids. Remember, this Bible tells us that it was vexing Lot's soul that he was here. But meanwhile, his whole family is being destroyed. That'll tell you something, won't it? That Christians, you can be, when you have those moments that I'm not living right, I shouldn't be doing this thing, or I shouldn't be here with these people, and you're vexed a little bit, I'm vexed, I'm vexed, I'm vexed. You know what that is a, that, that is a big sign for? Get your family out of there. Because what vexes you might destroy somebody else. Think about that. We think, well, we're so strong, we're not going to get duped by Sodom. That's probably what Lot's thinking. I'm not going to be hurt. I know what's right, what's wrong. Well, you raised your whole family there, and they got consumed. They got taken over. Beware, Christian, with what vexes you. If it vexes you, it'll destroy a weaker brother. Think about that when you're watching anything or doing anything. Think about like watching movies. Say there's some wicked part on some movie. They're blaspheming God or it's just very sensual or something. It's vexing you. Ah, shouldn't be watching this. Imagine what it's doing to your 11-year-old son. Imagine what it's doing to your weaker brother. Whatever it is, think about that. That idea of vexing your soul and, and you being okay with it, it could be the complete undoing of someone that you love who's weaker, maybe lost. Here, she walks, she looks back, she turns into a pillar of stone. She loved the world and she loved everything in it. Job's love of the world led his family to love the same thing, to its entire destruction. What do you love? You say, Logan, well, I love my possessions, I love my, I love my friends, I love all these things. And that's just me being a good, loving Christian. No, that's you love in the world. Look at Genesis 19, verse 31. We're almost done. This feels like a pretty heavy lesson for a Wednesday night when I was wanting something soft, but, but I think it's a danger, and I think it's how a lot of our churches and our friends and Christian families have gone down the drain over the years. Let sin be paraded in your streets and in your hallways of your home and in the aisles of your church, and no one say it's wrong. Well, give it 10, 20, 30 years, and pretty soon it'll be knocking on the doors, <laughs> breaking them down. Look at Genesis nineteen thirty one. Really not funny, is it? Nineteen thirty one, and this is oh, this is that point that preachers love to make, and it's not mine, but it preaches the, that point that you can get the daughters out of Sodom, but you can't get Sodom out of the daughters because watch Lot, his wife now is a is a is stoned, but he's got his daughters and watch their morals. Thirty one, and the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth come let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father they're very immoral people they have relations with their fathers they breed these civilizations that are very um, um, end up being enemies of God's people for years to come so it was not God's will it was called sin but the point is this is how he raised his kids or didn't raise his kids while he loved the world this is where they ended up. I want you to ask down deep. We've got a baby back there in the back. We've got other kids in the church. Do we love them enough to drop our love for the world? Because a lot of the decisions we make right now will absolutely impact them. Absolutely impact them, right? That's why that we get the warning. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's why we get the warning. It will, our undue focus for loving worldly things will take our eyes off of loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's the lesson tonight. Sorry, kind of heavy, but pray for me, I'll pray for you. Pray for us to keep our, our love where it should be on God and on others. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the Bible. Lord, it's a warning tonight for my soul and for everybody here about what can happen when we misplace our love lord we start loving this world more than you we start then lord loving evil more than good 
We know, Lord, that's just going to ask for evil to spread. That's going to ask for evil to spread throughout our, Lord, our, our own hearts, people we love, our homes, our church, our families. Lord, help us call evil what it is, and Lord, help us to abhor it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.